So you betrayed your friend. Your other friend rolled his ankle on a hike and your other other friend wants to take a nice jaunt through a spooky forest in Sweden to get to the bar at a quicker pace, huh? Well, I hate to say it, but when you forest when you should mountain, you're gonna have a bad time. Deep in the mountains of Sweden, which looks nice now, but uh, I probably won't go there anymore, a group of friends is mourning the passing of their other friend all because Mr. Spineless didn't stick up for his buddy. The theme today is dunking on him with the illest of will, although there is something to be said about never knowing what you're gonna do in the moment. And if you weren't aware, there is a third option in fight or flight and it's called freeze and freeze this man did. Anyhow, as they are completing their last hike their buddy wanted to take before he was met with an untimely end at the hand of British crackheads, or as we just call them standardly, Londoners, a series of unfortunate events would befall the group, resulting in them having to basically cut through a forest in order to get to their destination faster. This would prove to be generally regarded as a bad idea. As they delved deeper into the woodland area, it became apparent that something else was with them. So in today's episode, I am only about three years late on the draw on this one, but considering I only recently started adding supernatural creatures to this channel, I guess I could have been slower. Let's take a look at the story and creature behind the movie The Ritual and figure out what in the name of all that is pagan is this thing. Also, someone asked Sweden if they're doing okay with creatures up there like this. So we all know the drill by now, but for all new people, up on screen there'll be a timestamp. If you want to bypass the summary of this movie and get to the lore of this man bear elk, then head there. For all others, let's talk about what we learned from German folk tales, which aren't really much better, to always bring breadcrumbs when you've decided to enter a deep dark forest on a mountainside when it's rainy and the sun goes down at like 2 p.m. Oh, also, I have not forgotten about video games in Roanoke Gaming. I will definitely be covering more. I just needed to reestablish my footing after getting absolutely wrecked in November and December in terms of this channel. No idea what happened. YouTube just told me they fixed something and then things went back to normal. The key to being a YouTuber is just don't think too much about it and don't mind the shaky bridge that falls into a meat grinder. So we start off our story with a group of friends, or as I'm led to believe, mates, watching fake football as American football is the real football. As you know, I have to keep my editor on his toes, and if you aren't poking fun at the man helping on a project, what are you even really doing with your life? As the group is talking about where to go for Dude's Night Out trip, Amsterdam gets thrown out, and from what I've heard, it's great if you aren't married, so that's off the table. Another suggests Belgium, which apparently nobody has been there by choice, and I'm glad to see that it's not just Americans that dunk on Europeans and vice versa, but also Europeans dunking on Europeans. Excellent. Robert suggests that they go hiking in Sweden, to which everyone just sort of looks at him. I mean, hiking is actually pretty great. It's nice to get out of the concrete jungle where the junkies are, but it would appear, though, that they should have left a little earlier. Heading back from the bar, Luke wants to tie one on and stops off at a corner store. So I want you to look at, like, how crowded this place is. Like, there's everybody in the streets all over the place. Heading inside, as they continue discussing what to do, Luke looks over and sees a woman in the corner cowering. Two junkies, see, I told you there were junkies out there, come and start yelling at Robert, and Luke immediately puts his tail between his legs when he has a bottle in hand and then goes and hides. Look, I can't trash Luke too much. Again, you never truly know what you're going to do and react in the moment. It's just a fact of life. We all really want to be the hero of the story, but people do get scared. But bro, it's England. We know lead probably isn't going to be flying around, so swing away, Meryl. You have a bottle in hand. But he doesn't. He continues to hide. Robert is on his own, so they take his wallet, and then they want his ring. And I gotta throw this out there. Just remember, jewelry isn't really worth getting your head cracked open for, so just give it to him. That's why I wear a $300, like, carbon titanium ring. Anyways, Robert refuses and gets piped to the dome, causing what appears to be hemorrhaging in the brain, while Luke continues to cry in the corner, and that's all she wrote for Robert. Nice job, Luke. Six months later, we now flash over to the hiking trip in North Sweden. Luke wakes up apparently having dreamed about that. Popular word, but it's likely some legit trauma. May all of us never be faced with a choice like that. As his friends get up, they all get some coffee, and then begin their hike, looking for a place to pay tribute to their fallen friend Robert, finding a rocky upcropping, they place all their possessions that they brought for him in a picture, and then pour some out for their recently passed friend. Eventually, they leave the memorial and continue on their hike. As they are walking along, the teacher known as Dom ends up rolling his ankle and getting injured. I mean, that was a pretty huge hole, by the way, so nice catch, Dom. Now, standard protocol says to walk it off, as it's literally your only option. You sit for a moment, make sure it isn't broken, and then keep moving. Eventually, they say they might just leave him there and go get help, which may have actually probably been the best decision. But he decides to pull together and then keep walking. Hutch brings up that'll take about 14 hours for them to get to town, and they are attempting to reach it possibly a little earlier. So if they cut through the deep, dark, spooky woods, they could be knocking back pints by that evening. With the promise of ethanol beverages, they decide that that is their best option, which I would have to agree, to be honest with you. Also, I just want to point out, this friend group is a lot like uh, American friend groups. They don't really seem to even remotely like each other. I mean, it must be hard to nail in movies or something. Anyways, approaching the woods, they start talking about how they should have gone to Vegas, which I'm pretty sure there's worse monsters there, am I right? But then they 
spot a VW bus parked all the way out there, and it's overgrown, meaning whoever parked it there never came back. That should have probably been a bit of a warning, but there's bears in the woods, so who knows what happened to random people over time that hike in it. I mean, it's probably not an elk monster, that would be crazy. Moving into the woods, just inside the cusp of them, Hutch's compass then stops working, so that's probably a good sign. Although things can mess with that, like large iron deposits in the ground, and this can kind of make them sort of go haywire, so it's really nothing to fear immediately, but probably a little strange considering they just walked in and outside of it it was fine. As they're in there also, the question gets thrown around about why it's too quiet. Now usually there are some birds or animals or insects or something. I'm not really familiar with Sweden's forest, but in the south of the United States, there usually is some kind of noise, so complete silence isn't a good thing. Usually that only happens when there's predators nearby. Continuing on their jaunt, this is a really thick forest and they're all starting to get a little hungry. Looks like they're gonna have to eat Dom as he's the weakest, but not if the elk man gets him first. They begin talking about Robert, which bums them out pretty quickly, and then stop to find an elk completely gutted up in the tree. They hypothesize it's probably a bear that put it up there. That's a real stupid idea you got there. Also, that thing is still literally bleeding, so that would be a very good sign to leave. Things are getting late, and they are still out in the woods. Of course, in autumn, late is like noon there. Plus, the thunderstorms moving in isn't really helping things. As they discuss if they should pitch a tent, they see Norse symbols carved in the trees before finding a very old cabin in the woods, which is usually a good sign, right? Before Luke walks in, though, he once again shows us his ability to freeze up when he hears something outside and spins around and then just stands there. Wonderfully done, Luke. Closing the door, Phil knows what's up, suggesting that this is the house that they get murdered in. They take a look in the interior and then find more Norse symbols hanging all over the place. I think I'd rather just keep walking in the rain at this point, but then again, I'd be the guy that probably gets gutted and hung up in a tree. Luke is fairly convinced that he has seen something and continues to look outside as Phil heads upstairs to search for stuff to burn. Opening a door to the back room, he finds a crude wicker man. Phil says it's witchcraft, which, is paganism witchcraft? Google says no. Wicca, which is related to witches, started in England, whereas paganism was in Central Europe. Everyone had their own gods back in the day, but this specific instance is not witchcraft. Moving on. As they sit around the wood-burning stove, they talk about the next day. Luke says that they need to go back the way they came, as he's pretty spooked. Hutch says that they don't need to add a day to the trip for nothing. They are almost through. So they call it, and then go to sleep for the night, in a rickety cabin, in the woods, with creepy symbols everywhere. Very good. I mean, don't take shift, guys. That would be just totally a waste of time. Especially considering you're in a house that you really don't know if it's even remotely populated, or if anybody's actually supposed to be there. But then we get a creeping shot to the house, so that's not good. As Luke lies there, it quickly snaps back to daylight. He attempts to wake up Hutch, but nobody moves. As he opens the door, he's back in the shop where Robert got his brain some air. It's pretty clear that he's straight up hallucinating as the shelves get pulled away and he's outside. Bit of sleepwalking, eh? But as Luke looks down, he's got holes in his chest and is bleeding. Not life-threatening, but they are in fact there. And that's completely horrifying. But at that moment, Hutch is having nightmares too, and he's screaming in the cabin. He's also peed his pants, and Dom is in the corner freaking out, yelling for his wife, and everyone's brains appear to have been scrambled to some degree. But there is someone missing. Phil. Finding his jacket on the stairs, Phil is in the nude upstairs praying to the wicker man, so uh, I would say y'all need to GTFO immediately. Obviously being a little rattled by that, they find that the Norse symbols are all over the trees. Dom decides Hutch doesn't know where he's going and then spots a path. Saying screw it, he decides that's their best option as it means civilization. But which civilization is it? Because I'm pretty sure cannibals also have a civilization. Phil decides to follow first and then the rest with Dom taking point. Bet that whiskey Hutch had earlier would probably come in handy right about now. The group is feeling a little uneasy. As this point, they really have no idea where this path goes. But looking at the top of a ridge, they can see light, so they assume they're close to the forest edge. As they move along a pathway, they find another cabin and decide, no, we're not going in there. Probably a good call. Dom decides that they need to stop for a minute as his knee is killing him. Dom is being obstinate about leaving, and at this point, Luke takes off to check the ridge to see if it's actually a way out. Well, it seemed pretty cut and dry, but when a pagan god is after your meat suit, it never really is. Coming up to the new area of the forest, it's more open, but that's just means you can really see what's near you, which is never good. Looking at his chest wound, he hears something and then sees a hand like 12 feet up in a tree, so uh, that's pretty spooky, so he bolts back to the group. Luke shows the group his wound, and Dom tells him that he did it to himself. Dom apparently has some beef with Luke over the Robert situation. Dom blames Luke for not standing up for Robert, and then Luke punches Dom, and as he eloquently puts it, oh, so you do have some fight in you, but only when you're punching your friends. Hutch tells Luke that he doesn't know whose fault it was, but everyone is dogpiling on him at this point. The 
The not so cheery jaunt gets worse as out of all the places they could have stopped, they also find a small piece of fabric in the ground. Pulling it out, it appears to have been a parachuter and Broham did not make it out. Just a boot, backpack, and wallet. Despite walking for three hours and the only time it's sunny in Sweden, they find themselves back out there at night and decide to pitch tents. Also, Dom's knee is actually screwed a bit, so I guess he wasn't lying about that. Butch tells Luke about their plan tomorrow to hike out of there and that they all go to bed. And again, after that night previous, sleeping in shifts is absolutely the move. Luke hears something out there, but then goes into his tent anyways. And as he's messing with some of the stuff, he hears something again moving around them. And now he's back in the shop, watching Robert get got all over again before the junkie looks over and sees him. It's clear something is rather large and around their camp at this point. Hutch's tent gets grabbed up, and now he's grabbed as they hear him screaming, and then nothing else in the distance. The group goes running after him, but Hutch is no longer answering. Dom says they're going to get lost and that they need to go back to camp. That seems to have failed as they sit out in the woods until morning. At least things are lighter concerning weight to carry because you don't have your tents anymore, but walking through the pathways, Luke is the first to see it. Our boy Hutch over here has been completely gutted and then hung up in a tree like curing beef jerkies. <laughs> Big oof there. Getting him down, they need his compass, but his compass is also not working properly anyways because they're kind of in a supernatural area. So they take supplies from him and then they use what they can. Phil suggests Hutch was intentionally put there as they knew they were coming this way, so that's not good either. And again, Phil knows what's up. Dom makeshift buries Hutch under some sticks as they don't have time for rituals. <laughs> but now they entered another portion of the forest as they ask Luke what he saw the day previously. Despite him answering, Dom still does not believe him. Finding a muddy water puddle, they now all have dysentery because they drink from it. But what they do spot in the creek bed are a pair of footprints. Phil asks, are they really going to follow these prints? Which finally, they listen to this man and then go the other way. Basically, at this point, Phil just totally sealed his fate. Because now, Phil is really kind of looking like the best team leader they got. But then again, considering we see this thing move in the background in the direction that they are going, maybe they should have. Although maybe it was really just a failed trap. As they crest a ridge, Luke spots a bit of a clearing and sees a mountain ridge with the exit to the woods being just beyond the other mountain. Phil though looks a little strange sitting there as Luke looks out and sees fires in the woods. Returning back to Phil and Dom, Phil is not paying attention to Luke as he asks him a question. Shining his flashlight around, Phil gets grabbed by the creature and immediately dragged off to meet Mr. Old's sharp pointy branches. Luke gets up and then takes off running, slamming his head into a tree before once again dreaming of Robert. He runs out of the store to spot his friend before coming to looking at a flashlight. Looking for both Dom and Phil, nope, they are both gone. And all around him, he can hear whatever it is stalking him. Turning around, he spots Dom hiding. He tells Luke it's big, scary, and pink. Actually, it's really just fast and big. Luke tells him that he found a way out, but he needs to move his leg. Knowing the thing is over in the trees, they take off running on three as this thing is clearly stalking them. Why they stop running is beyond me. That's not gonna help. They look up and see the tops of trees bending, meaning that this thing is pretty large. They literally trip out of the woods and then come to a lit pathway. You ever feel like you're being herded towards a certain direction? Well, they should now. Looking up, they spot Phil is also hanging in the tree now and running to a small cabin, the place they chose to avoid earlier, now appears to be their only refuge. Getting in and shutting the door, they see an old lady playing a record and standing by the fire before they are both knocked out by cult members. Then their hands are bound to the floor and things aren't looking good for them. People are outside and they appear to be building some sort of pagan cross, although it's more Y-shaped. Again, things aren't looking good for what's left of the squad. As people come in and give Luke something to drink, none of them are looking too healthy. Life of a cult member will probably do that to you. She looks at the wounds at Luke's chest before showing him that she has the same one too. Looks like they identify who's been chosen based on this wound. Dom doesn't have one, so they grab him and bring him upstairs before they appear to like do something to him. Anyhow, later a woman comes in and says they are preparing a sacrifice. Although they return Dom back, they literally just beat the crap out of him. <laughs> but I mean, he's still in the same shape as what he, I don't know why they did this to him. Anyways, Dom Dom talks about how he saw his wife in his nightmare and how he saw what was happening to him. He tells Luke that if he survives, he needs to burn this place down. Hell yeah, brother. Burn it to the ground and get some crusades up in that forest. And now we can cue the sabaton. So now Dom is brought outside and tied to the cross thing. And in the distance, there's quite a few bodies placed all over the trees. So <laughs> this isn't looking good. Being left there as night descends, Luke is attempting to break free to help Dom. Dom begins yelling at the cult to get on with it and get on with it they do. The trees start shifting as Luke dislocates his thumb to escape, but uh, I don't think he's gonna make it. Dom then looks out and sees Gale exiting out of the woods. 
When your wife exits out of the woods and she seems completely fine, it's probably not your wife. She comes up to him as her eyes change, and instead it's Mr. Creepy Elk Man as he rips him off the cross. He drags him over to a tree and then impales him. So now all that's left is Luke. He puts his hand back into the binds to appear captured as a woman enters and gives him food, which she doesn't look like she's too much into this cult and may have some humanity. But uh, here, here's my only thing. His hands are bound to the floor behind his back. How is he supposed to eat? Luke asks what that thing is, and she responds, it's a god. And there's actually only one god, ma'am. That thing keeps them there, and she goes on to say it's a privilege to worship it. It says that they will all be placed in the trees because that's just how they roll, which Luke at this point decides it's time really to nope out of there. Moving through the creepy cabin, the cult of personalities are standing outside worshiping further, getting ready for Luke's sacrifice. Or, eh, it's probably not a sacrifice. As Grandma Culty goes to retrieve Luke, he's upstairs looking at the very many previous cult members who have gathered over time in this room. What's worse is they're actually still alive, so Luke does the right thing and relieves them of their not-so-mortal coil. Heading downstairs, Grandma confronts him and he just straight up punches her lights out. Good lord. But as the members burn, this rustles the jimmies of the elk god. Everyone falls to their knees as not to get got and Luke goes to lock and load Brides of Christ. The elk very obviously upset starts grabbing members for recompense and as Luke exits the room, another cult member has his hands up saying, look, I washed for supper before taking some lead to the guts. Walking into the next room, a cult member drops his axe and falls to his knees as the elk god drops the woman's body from earlier. He's been snacking on some eyes apparently. Luke runs out and we get a good look at this thing. Luke raises his man's answer and then takes a pot shot, but uh, well you just alerted that thing that you were right over there, so now it turns into a game of keep away, which hasn't really gone well. It's clear this thing can make you hallucinate at this point using your memories as it makes him see the store. Luke says whatever and keeps running as he's almost out. The creature catches up to him and pulls Luke up in the air and then looks at him, but then drops him for some reason. Oh wait, I guess because it looks like he's submitting. The thing rears up and now we see that it's super hideous. Luke stands up and then it grabs his head, pushing him into the dirt. Hallucinating Robert, Luke grabs an axe and slices the thing, injuring it as he apparently does have some fight after all, just when it comes to his own life I guess. Sprinting out of the woods and into the clearing, he looks back to see the creature cannot leave that area. Yelling at it, it yells back and it's kind of like a Rottweiler behind a large fence. Luke begins walking amongst the hills and spots a road in the distance with a car on it. Being the sole survivor, I'm thinking my game plan would be to come back with several gallons of gas and let it all burn. Time to weed out the old gods. Alright, so what is this thing and why would anyone ever take the time to worship something that completely wrecks you if you make one mistake and furthermore, why not pretend to worship it and then go like, oh I gotta go pick some berries on the edge of the forest or something and then just straight up leave and never return back and go back to your normal life. Well let's talk about that shall we because there's some lore on these things that back in the day, sure, when we were simply building fires and at the complete mercy of whatever was out there, it may have been uh, not so awesome for us, but since splitting the atom and obtaining the power of the universe, I think we could just nuke it from orbit. Starting with the forest, this was likely not the original forest size back in the day. As made mention by Hutch, this whole area at one point was a vast sprawling forest, only now has it really changed with only patches of the forest left. It appears to have just been a side comment, but this may explain why some of the forest gods' jimmies have been rustled to this extent. The forest acts as its domain, and as long as trees are present, it is able to effectively inhabit that area and appears to have existed just in there. When Luke makes it out of the forest, it has to stop just at the edge as it appears to be where the domain ends. Now all I'm saying is, it must be related to magic, and this being the reason it has to stay in the actual forest itself, because I've seen orca whales beach themselves to grab seals and then head back in. So I'm not really thinking uh, there would be a reason for this creature to just stand there, more so when Luke is actively taunting it just beyond the veil of the woods. Which is quite the bold strategy, Cotton. So next, what actually even is this thing? Well, it's referred to as motor, which you're gonna have to bear with me because this is Norse, and I'm not 100% certain of the pronunciations, but I'm pretty sure I can mimic them. Which is why I'm gonna tell you it is known as a Jotun, which is related to paganistic culture in Europe back in the day, and is related to Odinism. So it's about to get real deep in the culture of the Nordic people, by the way. Again, referred to as Mulder, which I'm just pretty sure I'm changing the pronunciation each time, this would translate into English as mother. Now, you might be sitting there saying, well, wait a minute, isn't this a son of Loki? And yes, for some reason in the actual movie, they refer to Mulder as son of Loki, but in reality, it was a female in the novel. What had happened was, at some point, a small village existed back in the day in these woods. This would imply that these people set up shop and then this thing showed up. Considering the ages of the bodies that we see hanging out inside the attic, this may also imply that considering the forest was way more vast back in the day, which seems to be the common theme in Europe, because they really did cut down a lot of their forests, which also, fun fact, in the US, there's not supposed to be deforestation, as for every tree cut down by companies, more are planted, as to avoid what happened in Europe. So see, we occasionally learn from things. Now this is not to say there are no forests in Europe, or like 
trees or anything. So before you hop into the comments section, that has been said. There's just considerably less as laws were different 150 years ago and reforestation was not really looked at as necessary. Typically, we know different now because we probably don't want to deep fry the planet in a few thousand years. Anyway, so it appeared to me that this small village was likely not a target initially to Mulder because, again, small village in the woods. Likely there were many more areas to wander and traverse as the woods were all free game to this thing. However, humans are gonna human and without even realizing it, we began limiting the real estate owned by a pagan god until eventually, like a rising ocean making one piece of land into a bunch of islands, the same thing would happen to this area of the forest. Once this creature was cut off, typically because of its Yolten heritage, it likes to be basically revered in worship because these things have got an ego that makes the human ego look like a monk by comparison. Upon finding this small town, likely back in the day there were several towns that would worship this thing to keep it at bay, but now, to keep this small town alive in exchange for their worship, she would offer them immortality, which sounds like a terrible idea because the way they're living, A, seems really boring, and B, horrible all around. I mean, like, I do enjoy dark, scary woods just as much as the next guy, but I would not want to stay there until the sun goes supernova. But walking it back for a moment, I kind of glossed over what a Jotun was. So what is this thing? Well, it typically refers to non-human figures in North mythology, such as anything apart from humans, dwarves, and elves. It's not really well defined, though, as sometimes they're all also called trolls. But even then, it gets more interconnected as sometimes Jotun are also simultaneously connected with the ice giants that Odin promised to deal with back in the day. But then it even goes further than that when they say Odin and Thor themselves are descended from the Jotnar, which are related to the Jotuns. Now, it may just be my layman's perspective, but it appears to be a whole mess of supernatural conglomerations that eventually led to other sects of supernatural conglomerations that were against the others. And this really wouldn't be that strange considering, I mean, look at humanity. We were literally the same species with slight variations in appearance and typically we were at one another's throats all the time. So why not supernatural paganistic gods that look different from one another? Although I will also add, it appears that even though some of these supernatural beings are related to others in terms of lineage, some appear to look like man, obviously, while others look more like twisted beasts, and even still, some are considered to be absolutely beautiful. So it's really just luck of the draw on what you end up as. Motor ended up with some of the worst luck imaginable because she definitely falls in the range of twisted beast. So let's take a look at her, shall we? To start, this thing is gigantic. As you might imagine, it's picking up full-grown men and yeeting them into tree branches. Standing at roughly 12 feet tall, but likely still over that, it's actually going to have to bend down pretty far to look into doorways. And considering this is Europe, that comes out to about 3.65 meters tall. She's a fairly tall lass. She also appears to be an amalgamation of an elk and human torso missing its head. Due to the height she is, let's attempt to figure out how much she weighs. But you should never ask a female paganistic god that at all. So the average elk male stands at roughly 5 feet tall and can weigh between 700 to 11 1100 pounds depending on several factors, with the females weighing between 500 to 600 pounds with an average of 4.5 feet tall because sexual dimorphism is a real thing in the world, don't let anyone tell you any different. Now it really doesn't matter though whether she's male or female because she absolutely dwarfs any of the standard elk at 2.4 to 2.6 times the size of the average male elk. On top of this, she is said to be about 12 feet tall, but I don't think anyone has gotten her to sit still long enough to measure her actual height. Judging by the houses around her and just how much taller she stands than the average Average man, I would put it in reality between 12 feet to 14 feet. She seems rather proportional to an elk as well, so splitting the difference, I would imagine her closer to 13 feet tall. We will keep it in the median with the average male elk at around 900 pounds. So I will give you the heathenistic metric measurements in a moment. So if you take 2.6 times 900, that comes out to 2,340 pounds, so over a ton of wheat, or about 1,061.4 kilograms of elk body mass. But you can't forget, there's more attached than just that. With the human torso, legs, and arms attached, which is actually the head of this creature, the average adult male human, because it does look like an adult male human based on chest features, we could realistically add about another 150 pounds, which comes out to a grand total of 2,490 pounds or 1,129 kilograms. And at a height of 13 feet averaged or just about four meters tall, again, she's pretty thick. The size of the elk body and the quadrupedal locomotion allows her to run through the forest much faster than a human can traverse. And at that height, she almost has a bird's eye view, at least in the tree branches of looking down on potential prey that enters her domain. The head also has full functionality concerning movement. It doesn't just appear to be a human body, but is also able to act like one too. Using the arms to grasp where the head should be, there are just a pair of yellow eyes and complete blackness. What's interesting though is the Jotun also shows that somewhere in the coding of their genes, the human body structure exists in these twisted beasts. Amongst the beautiful uh, examples of Jotun, which is beautiful by a measurement of human standards, these also exist, taking into consideration further that that Odin and Thor are said to look like humans as well in some capacity, just way more jacked, which also 
suggests, which I'm not really into pagan religion, so someone correct me if I'm wrong, that humans in some capacity must also be related to all the gods that they worship, which actually seems to be a common theme in humanity. We are related to what we worship, or we come from them in some capacity. But moving on, considering Motor is supernatural, she also has the supernatural capacity to completely scramble your brains, which is where she looks for certain criteria to be her followers. So I just want to point out something real quick. It's Jotun, but Motor. It could be Motor. It could be Mudder. I'm gonna go with Motor, and that's just me making sure I'm saying that correctly. So Motor has the ability to influence how humanity sees everything around it and what's actually happening. When it first comes into contact with the friend group, Hutch pees himself and is screaming during a night terror. Phil strips down and starts to worship the wicker man upstairs, and Dom starts screaming about his wife while Robert is still worm food. The only one to really do anything apart from have their brain completely just messed with is Luke, who goes outside to see what has happened to Robert. This is essentially Motor reading the minds of their victims. For Motor to choose a specific person and add them into the fold of those that worship her, they need to have exhibited great pain at some point in their life. Except this pain needs to be something that will haunt them forever, no matter where they go. For this to happen, it appears that she must force those memories to re-emerge in the mind itself, which, when everyone was sleeping, has different effects on different people. Ultimately, Luke would be chosen to join the group of those that worship Mulder, to which she would systematically begin taking out other members of his group. The reason is based on the person as much as it is the pain. Mental resilience does exist within our species and varying levels of it. There are those that can witness horrible things, deal with it in the best capacity that they can, and then move on due to this resilience. Whereas others who may have witnessed the same thing would be mentally broken for the rest of their lives. And this is what Motor actually feeds on. For everyone in the group, as with all humanity, we all deal with mental anguish in different ways. What affects one person and vice versa is completely different amongst the individual. That's what makes human interactions and experiences fairly dynamic. Every one of the friends in the group had a different pain associated with the passing of Robert and likely had different pains in their life as well. Not likely, they did. It's just the reality of being human. But even prior to Robert's ultimate demise, Luke appeared to be the most vulnerable mentally. And he's the whole reason they even went into that liquor store to begin with. Judging by the expressions the rest of the group had when he mentioned that they should go in and tie on another one, and the fact that it was the middle of the week or a Sunday night, as Dom said it was a school night and he was a teacher, it's possible Luke does not effectively deal with traumatic events as well as others might. Because of this, when Mulder looked into each of them and determined who was in the most pain, she chose Luke. Luke. All the other people back at the small village consisting of like one house all had the same issues as Luke, just in different ways. They had all been in great pain at some point in their lives, which made it easier for the Jotun to warp their minds and not have them fight back. They would be impressed into a life of servitude with apparent immortality, but really it's like a deal with a genie or the monkey paw scenario. From what we saw in the attic, yes, you are technically immortal, but the issue is your body continues to age and decay as you also age. So uh, be careful what you wish for. Those that have gotten to the point that their bodies can no longer move and function, will still be kept alive in a dark attic, sitting on benches until again the sun goes supernova, or some dude with a torch comes in and lights them all up. This also happens to be what sends Motor into a rage. She's not a merciful god, that's for sure. Whether it's taking those who have not experienced enough pain and have mental resilience and slamming them into a tree, which is why Hutch was grabbed first as he was keeping the group focused and together, or destroying her followers for allowing Luke to burn down the cabin, she really doesn't seem to be a great thing to worship. Anyhow, once Luke was marked, he would essentially be given a choice, worship or perish. But after the cabin fiasco, it seems like she does not really so much give him a choice, but instead pushes him down until he eventually stands back up again and catches her with an axe. This makes me think that the amount of worship she receives is what gives her the power she has, and the blow she just received concerning the burned followers in the attic had greatly weakened her, allowing Luke to even have the possibility of escaping. Lastly, I want to talk about how you really bring this thing down. It appears to me that it's definitely corporeal in some capacity, but its main weakness, it's really just completely tied to the woods in which it resides. If any institution became aware of this thing's actual existence, which if Luke isn't held as completely having lost his mind when he returns home, this is actually a fairly easy takedown. While it is possible for this thing to screw with your mind, an even easier scenario exists, which we have all probably just thought about and I mentioned it earlier. Just straight up burn the forest down. This could be something as easy as Luke literally coming back with a gas can and a lighter. Stay right outside the perimeter and then just start throwing gas everywhere. Perhaps come back during the drier periods as well when the woods aren't so wet. This would be between about January and June, so split the difference and come back in like April. Light it on fire and get out of Dodge. If the whole thing gets burned down, then the Jotun has 
nowhere to go and would likely perish in the flames as well. The other option is capturing it. This one, you would likely have to ask yourself, what is the point? Considering it couldn't even enter a cabin in the first place, it's not supposed to leave the woods, it would appear to me that barriers are quite effective against this creature. While I can easily navigate the woods, human creations could confine it quite readily, like, you know, metal. The issue is, the bait used to lure it into a container, but it also may be as simple as just injuring it. We know Luke was able to hurt it pretty good by destroying a chunk of its followers and then hurt it again with an axe to make his escape. So by this logic, other forms of counters, potentially force multiplication, would be on the table to take this thing out or at least subdue it. But again, I doubt the military would really take this thing seriously to any degree, but who knows what sort of programs exist if there's actual Jotuns running around in the woods. But there's also the issue of if you do capture it and you do remove it from the woods, does it just straight up dematerialize? Because again, it is based on magic. Mulder preys on the vulnerable concerning those who have experienced great pain through mental anguish, which makes them more susceptible to her influence. Finding the leader of any group out there and taking them out, she will continue to single out those that she wants before finally making them choose to serve her or become meat pinatas put up in the trees. Luke would finally go on to find his manhood between his legs and despite not helping Robert, had no problem helping himself in the end and escaping. What a guy. 